Well, this subject is interesting, the origins and demise of the Pharisees. The Pharisees are a, a sect of people that we read a lot about in the Scripture, and uh, it's not very clear to, to a lot of folks uh, who they are, what they thought. Um, some folks have uh, told us this is the course they, they really are interested in. Uh, it, this this may be the case prior to this course, but it won't be the case after you finish. You won't have misunderstandings about the uh, Pharisees at all. They they are uh, a group that came and went in history. There are no more Pharisees now, but uh, uh, as you'll as you'll hear in the course content, they they had a definite origin and demise. Uh, the setting for the rise and fall is the intertestamental period, which uh, we don't always pay that much attention to. The Old Testament stopped some four centuries before Messiah. Uh, the Jewish people rebuilt their land painfully, got their temple worship started again. They were occupied by foreign powers. They had a difficult... It's hard to realize that lives were, were, were led and then people came and went, generations came and went in a time when God was silent as to uh, scripture and that uh, people trusted their whole lives through in Messiah and his coming kingdom. They waited, they prayed, they sacrificed, and uh, it gave rise to the sect of the Pharisees. We've already studied some of the events of that period, and uh, here again we're going to pay that time a visit. Uh, let's have a prayer. Heavenly Father, as we uh, think back to those who uh, valued you so much, especially at the time they started, and intended to uh, to lift your law to to a high degree in their lives and to inspire a nation. Uh, may we be as good as when they started, and may we avoid the pitfalls and the difficulties that happened as they went along. Uh, Lord, thank you for uh, saving for us this knowledge of this uh, splendid and interesting people called the Pharisees. Open our minds to this new lesson, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, a hearty shalom to all of you in Jesus' name. My name is Jeffrey Seif, and I'll be your instructor as we go through this interesting period in Jewish history. In particular, we're studying the subject of the intertestamental period, the period that begins following the close of the Old Testament canon and ends uh, just prior to the beginning of the New Testament. We're looking at life between the Testaments. And it's an important study for various reasons. One of which is that by understanding the intertestamental period, it enables one to understand the world that Jesus came into. We're going to be studying this period. We're going to be looking at how different uh, prophecies in the Old Testament uh, tell us about events uh, that were to take place, and indeed were uh, fulfilled during the intertestamental period. This is a world of political intrigue. It's a world of jockeying for positions for leadership. It's, the, it's a world wherein we see shifting world powers and, and their effects on Jewish life. Truly, this study belongs in any study uh, of Jewish Christian studies, and not just in Jewish Christian studies. You know, most... Um, Students in seminary and Bible college go through at least an introductory study to the intertestamental period. I remember as I was studying the life of Christ, that was the name of the course, it was called the life of Christ, and as a textbook, uh, I used uh, the book written by Dr. Alfred Edersheim called The Life and Times of Jesus the Messiah. Most uh, seminary graduates uh, have to study this book. It's a fascinating book. Dr. Edersheim is both a historian and a theologian, and he goes in great depth in his exhaustive study of the Jewish roots of the gospel and shows the parallels between the two. And uh, he's, a, he's a hard act to follow. Um, of course, in this institute, we're endeavoring to uh, show the connection between uh, the Old Testament and the New Testament and to show the connection between the Jewish roots of things and the New Testament. Dr. Edersheim does it quite well. It's a real exhaustive study. It's a, it's a lengthy book written in small print, and it's a fascinating, fascinating book. And he begins with a large study of the intertestamental period. 
Now, of course, the word large is relative. That can mean a hundred page or a thousand pages, depending how you look on it. Uh, suffice it to say that he really goes into it in great depth. And it was there uh, where I saw the, the need for one to understand the intertestamental period, along with my study of the life of Christ at, at Trinity. I also had a study on the intertestamental period at Moody Bible Institute. Uh, Dr. Goldberg, who taught the course, had written his uh, doctoral dissertation on this period. It's really a fascinating study, and, and I really hope to be able to convey to you certain things that I believe are important during this period of time. And remember that the intertestamental period enables one to understand the world that Jesus Christ entered. When Jesus came, he, t he spoke to certain people. Uh, of course, the people of Judea primarily, uh, not just Judea, but Jewish people throughout the regions of, of the land of Israel. And these people had certain views already of certain doctrines. And a lot of these views developed during the intertestamental period. Now, in our study of the early church, we delve into the doctrines that uh, developed during the intertestamental period. And we looked at various bodies of literature that developed during this time. In particular, we looked on the Targums, which are made up of the Targum Jonathan and the Targum Ankylos. Likewise, we discussed quite briefly the apocryphal literature and the pseudepigraphal literature and the uh, Talmud, the Mishnah, which came as a result of the oral traditions that were highly developed during this period. So, in our study of the early church, we understood something about the theological views that came about during this period. In this study, our focus is more on the historical, in order that one can understand something about the events that molded the backdrop to the New Testament time. It's, it's history. We studied intertestamental history in brief, in our study of Jewish history, and it's our purpose here to focus in on it in particular. Jewish history, we're zooming in on this era, the intertestamental period, once more. And we're doing it with a few objectives in mind. Number one is we want to trace the rise and demise of the parushim, of the Pharisees. You know, we see from New Testament works that the Pharisees weren't such good guys. This was the spiritual elite the leaders, the scholars, the doctors of theology, if you will, of the Jewish community uh, in the days of Christ. And we see that they really weren't in such good shape. There are a lot of scathing remarks aimed at the Pharisees in the New Testament. Well, the Pharisaical party didn't start off in such bad shape. In fact, these were the good guys once upon a time. We want to, we want to discuss the rise and demise of the Pharisees. Of course, our objective here as well is to bridge the gap in understanding of events between the Old Testament and New Testament. Oh, we want to better understand Hanukkah. It uh, seems like a side note, but a lot of us have Jewish friends, neighbors, co-workers, and the like, and we notice how they celebrate Hanukkah. The Christian church, the institutional church, has certain holidays that are dear to Christendom, such as uh, Easter and Christmas and the like. Well, here we're looking at the Jewish holiday of Hanukkah, and we'll see where it comes from and what it's all about. And lastly, we want to perhaps learn some lessons ourselves from the experiences of others. Here we're studying history. And we want to understand something about that history. And to do that, we're going to be looking at the events of history, plus how the Old Testament predicted the events of the intertestamental period quite clearly and graphically and wonderfully. The intertestamental period, the major events are all outlined in the Old Testament as we're going to examine. In particular, we're going to be looking at the book of Daniel. So we want to understand some history, and we're going to see the prophecy of the history, plus we're going to study the history itself. We're looking at, at, at what, what happened with people, and hopefully we'll do so in order to be able to glean some lessons from the mistakes that took place during this intertestamental period. Well, let's begin our study of the intertestamental period by first looking at the close of the Old Testament. And to briefly recap what we've discussed in Jewish history and in our survey of the Old Testament, uh, let's go back in our thinking to the time when the Israelites, the, those in Judea rather, were taken captive to Babylon. We remember how there was a civil war in the Old Testament time and the kingdom was divided between the ten tribes to the north and the two tribes to the south. 
A few prophets went and ministered uh, specifically to the northern kingdom and urged them to repent, saying that if you don't, destruction is imminent because God is going to judge your sin here and now. And so it was as there was not a revival, there was no repentance amongst the, among the northern kingdom, and the king of Assyria comes down and destroys, decimates the northern kingdom, leaving only the southern kingdom of Judah. Well, Judah wasn't so much better, as the prophets say, uh, that Judah needed to repent as well. And they were urged to turn to God, and, and, and which th this revival never really took place. And so it is that God brought Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, who came down and took uh, Judea as part of his empire. And finally, uh, because of rebellion in the land of Judea, Nebuchadnezzar comes down and he sacks the temple. He destroys it. He just obliterates the temple of the people of Israel, the people of God. And so it is we read the prophet Jeremiah lamenting the destruction of Jerusalem, the destruction of the temple in his book of Lamentations. Well, uh, the prophet predicted that the captivity would last for 70 years. Following the destruction of the temple, those who survived the sword, uh, many were taken away to Babylon, which was the new, um, the, the Jewish community was relocated. And eventually, the Babylonian Empire falls to the Persian and Median Empire. And so it is that the new king of Persia... Uh, puts forth a decree that the Jews who were exiled in Babylon would be allowed to return. And this takes us to Ezra chapter 1. We read the edict wherein the king decreed that those who would like to could return to resettle and rebuild uh, the land. And so it is we know from the second chapter of Ezra that about 50,000 or so Jewish people left and came to rebuild. Ezra went back as well, and he was the spiritual leader of the people. He was the sage. And we read how the construction got going, but it didn't go very well. Ezra was a minister, not a politician, if you will. He wasn't an administrative leader. He was a spiritual leader. And so we come to Nehemiah, and here we are back in the Persian Empire. And Nehemiah, who occupied a sort of uh, semi-official role in the, um, the government there, hears word that things are not going good in the rebuilding process in Judea. And of, he himself, being a Jew, of course, had an interest in affairs there, and he was qu quite grieved uh, by the, the, the sad state of affairs. And so he petitioned the king, asking that he could have permission to go back and attend to the needs of his people, and he was granted permission. And so Nehemiah comes some years after Ezra, and Nehemiah is an administrator, and both of them lock horns together and begin uh, rebuilding, and not just not begin, rather, they, they finish the process. And so it is, is that things come together, and Voila, the temple is rebuilt, the walls are rebuilt around the temple, and things are getting going quite well. And we read about Haggai, who was a prophet during that time, who urges the people, listen, don't just build your own homes, it's time to rise and build the house of the Lord. And so it is as they were rebuilding, and they reestablished the homeland. Nehemiah as the civil leader, and Ezra as the priest. And all their efforts resulted in a return to Jewishness in Judea. And so it is, the Old Testament comes to a close. Now, not much is known from the close of the Old Testament to the year 333 B.C. We don't know much about them, but from what we do know about them, we're able to, to put a few pieces of the puzzle together and to develop an understanding of what took place during the intertestamental period from a historical point of view. We do know that in the land of Judea, there was a group known as the Sophrim, and this means the scribes or the schoolmen. These became known later as they became more and more organized, these leaders who became known as the scribes, the schoolmen, the teachers of the law. These people were formed into a body later uh, known as the men of the great synagogue, which later on became known as the Sanhedrin. Now, we know of the Sanhedrin from our study of the New Testament. 
uh, Paul speaks before the Sanhedrin, etc. We know about these people, the, the group of leaders of the Jewish community in the days of Christ. Well, the beginnings of this group are in the intertestamental period. These were the guardians of Judaism, the guardians of the temple, etc. And these are the grandfathers uh, to the Pharisees of Christ's day, the teachers. Now we can see the beginnings of them, or, or at least what many believe are the beginnings of them, in the book of Nehemiah. So turn, if you will, to Nehemiah chapter 8. And let's begin a little study here on uh, the beginnings of the Sophrim, the beginnings of the ancestors of the Pharisees. And again, when we're, when we're in Nehemiah chapter 8, we're seeing uh, how the rebuilding finally came together. The temple was built. People had their synagogues as well, which they brought back with them, the concept of the synagogue from the captivity. Remember that when the Jewish people were taken captive to Babylon, they no longer had a temple. And they needed an institution whereby they could teach tradition and the like, and teach not just a tradition, but uh, traditions invented by men rather, but, but a place to teach the traditions that were established by God. And the synagogue developed to serve that purpose. We come to Ezra chapter 8. The Jewish people are back in the land, the temple is rebuilt. Uh, the, the land is re-inhabited, Jewishness is back in the land, and we come to Ezra chapter 8, and all the people gathered themselves together as one man. We're in verse 1. And all the people gathered themselves together as one man into the street that was before the water gate. And they spake unto Ezra the scribe. By the way, let me tell you that Ezra, in Jewish theology, is called the second Moses. And perhaps you can figure out why. Remember, Moses was the one whom God used to lead the people back out of bondage to the Holy Land. Moses brought them from slavery beneath Pharaoh and brought them to the land of Israel. And Ezra brought them from Babylon to Israel. And so it is that they gathered together and spoke to Ezra the scribe, telling him to bring the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded to Israel. And Ezra the priest brought the law before the congregation, both of men and women, and all they could hear with understanding upon the first day of the seventh month. And he read therein before the street that was before the water gate, from morning until midday, before the men and the women and those that could understand, and the ears of all the people were attentive unto the book of the law. Now there you go, from early morning till midday they got together and had a service. A lot of us complain if the pastor speaks for more than 30 minutes. And Ezra the scribe stood upon a pulpit of wood which they had made for that purpose. And beside him stood some men which are listed here. And verse 5, And Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was above all the people. Well, of course he was above all the people. He was on that pulpit, that bima, that podium. He was, And he opened the book in the sight of all the people. And when he opened it, all the people stood up. And Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God, and all the people answered, Amen. Amen, with lifting up their hands, and they bowed their heads and worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. This was a happy group that was worshipful and thankful that God had, had brought them to this season. There's a Jewish prayer that goes, Baruch HaTor Anoi Eloheinu Melech HaOlam Shechionu V'Kiyamonu V'Yionu L'Azman HaZeh and it's thanking God for enabling us to reach the season. Well, these people were thankful. And they were worshiping. In verse 7, also Joshua and Benai, and it lists some names there, and it says, and the Levites, these group of Levites, caused the people, now here, pay attention please, they caused the people to understand the law, and the people stood in their place. So there were teachers there that were interpreting and, and helping the people to understand what the Bible was saying. They were making it very clear to them. Verse 8, so they read in the book of the law of God distinctly and gave the sense and caused them to understand the reading. So they didn't just read the scriptures, they explained it. So we see here, right at the close of the Old Testament, and even though Nehemiah isn't the last book written in the Old Testament, Nehemiah takes place right at the close of the Old Testament. And you might be better, best served to, to consult the chart which uh, we gave you in our study of the Old Testament, the one that was developed by uh, Dr. Paul Benoit. Uh, that chart helps us to see how Nehemiah is right at the end, chronologically, of the Old Testament. 
we see at that period there was a body of Jewish sages who were there instructing and teaching that were part of the system of worship. They were the Sunday school teachers, if you will, explaining the sense of the Bible, explaining the sense of the texts. And these are believed to be the beginnings of the men of the great synagogue, as they were known, this, this group of teachers. Well, that's right at the close of the Old Testament, and of course it, it, that, that flows into the beginning of the New Testament. Now let's set our eyes away from uh, the Bible and away from the events of the Jewish people in the intertestamental period, at the beginning of that period. Let's look at world powers now. Remember that Babylon had fallen to the Persian Empire and the Persians were in control. Now what happens is Xerxes, uh, the ruler of Persia, is defeated in war and Persia is now on the lame. Persia gets weak at the beginning of the New Testamental period. Now Greece, meanwhile, has a score to settle with them. And in the year 333 B.C., Alexander leads a highly trained army from Greece. And in three to four years, he takes away the entire Persian Empire. And of course, this Alexander that I'm referring to is none other than Alexander the Great. And we know him to be great from a military point of view. This man had some conquests under his belt at a very young age. You know, we have academies, uh, West Point, uh, Naval Academies, Annapolis, and what have you, they teach about war, the science of war, and they all study Alexander the Great. This was a warrior par excellence, if there is such a thing. Now, I'm not real big on wars in general, and no Christian really should be. Alexander the Great yet is noted in history. He has his place as a fascinating soldier. And so it is that he conquers the Persian Empire. So we see changing of hands. There was the Babylonian Empire, which swallowed up the Jews. And then the uh, Persian Empire swallowed up the Babylonians and let the Jews go back and resettle the homeland. Now, Greece comes and swallows up the Persian Empire. And now, the land of Israel has to deal with the Greek presence. In 331 B.C., Israel goes from Persian to Greek control. And Greek control brought some very unique problems with it that the Jewish people really didn't have to experience so much in, um, under other governments. When the, Greeks control, when the Greeks conquered a people, they didn't just uh, conquer and extract taxes from people. Uh, what happens is, is, is uh, a big world power would conquer a smaller power and would extract tribute, money. Uh, not necessarily money, but barter. They'd want goods or something to that effect. Um, now, the Greeks didn't just extract tribute, although they did do that. But they did much more than that. When the Greeks conquered a territory, they thought it within their own interests. And the interests of the people that they have conquered, they thought it best to impress and force their culture upon the people. For instance, Greek became the language of the day. People were required to learn Greek and speak Greek. And various things of the Greek culture began appearing in the land of Judea. Uh, chariot races, the public theater, uh, gymnasiums, foot races, and things like that. Now that seems quite harmless, doesn't it? Today we have the Olympics, and the Olympics begin uh, with the passing of the torch. Runners pass the torch, and finally there's one runner who goes to the stadium, and he lights the big, he takes the torch and he lights this big bowl, and the thing goes up in flames, and this marks the beginnings of the Olympic Games. Well, these, ha these games have their roots in ancient Greece, and it's not my object here to, to criticize the Olympics. I love the sports of the Olympics just as much as you do. But please understand that when the Olympics first got going, when Greek culture first um, developed this, and when it, when it became popular, all the athletes uh, were uh, parading around in the nude. They were just walking around in their birthday suits. Of course, Greek philosophy just exalts the... Um, the, the, the greatness of man, and so would his athletes would train their bodies. You'd see these magnificent male specimens going and throwing the discus and throwing the javelin and getting into foot races and things like that. 
while parading around in birthday suits is diametrically opposed to J- Jewish values, Jewish ethics, Jewish theology. And in particular, it's really diametrically opposed to the scripture itself. Very, very bad. And this whole system of things, and that's just one illustration of the Greek system that was forced upon the Jewish people, this system of things really caused problems. Well, of course, uh, this carried, this caused tension within the Jewish community who now were forced to deal with a foreign lifestyle and not just a foreign power. Remember that Judaism was getting organized back in Nehemiah 8. We see a good example of it being or, how it's organized and what have you. Now there are problems. You have the Sophrim, the men of the great synagogue, establishing a theocracy, a society where God was at the head. And they were able to do so beneath the Persians. But now, with the Greeks, the Greeks were pushing something upon the people. And there was a division. There were problems within the Jewish world. And so it is that with this new situation came a division amongst the Sophrim, amongst the scribes and the schoolmen. There was a division. And the division was known as there were those who were in the political party, or not a political party, we'll call them a political party. You know how in America we have Democrats and Republicans? Well, there were two parties that developed. The one was the House of Onias, and the other was the House of Tobias. Uh, Oniad, the house of Onias, those were the people who were faithful to the law of Moses. This party consisted of those who wanted to in- adhere to the principles of Scripture. The house of Tobias was different. These were those, the secularists, those who swayed from Scripture and wanted to assimilate and wanted just to simply adopt the views and the philosophies and the lifestyle of their captors. These were the modernists who said, "Listen, here we have to deal with Greek. We need to sh- with the Greeks. We need to shed these traditions and what have you that are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years old from Moses. Yeah, these served their time, but the house of Tobias says we're in modern days now. This is modern times, and we need to adjust to the modern world in which we live." Well, needless to say, that there were problems. Oh, by the way, this house of Onias here, uh, we, the house of Tobias, rather, those who assimilated and swayed, uh, these were the ones, if you read Nehemiah chapter 6, verse 1, we see the beginnings when these people uh, were giving problems to the people of Israel. There was always a kind of tension, but here it formed into two specific parties. The house of Onias, whose leader's name was Simon the Just, stood for three principles. They expounded three specific principles. One was Torah, the second was temple, and the third was pious lifestyle. This was the party platform, if you will. These were the three things that this party stood for. Torah, the adherence to the word of God. How can a young man keep his way pure? By guarding it according to thy word. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. His delight is in the law of the Lord. The house of Onias had their delight in the law of the Lord, and they wanted to adhere to Torah, to the books of Moses, to the Scripture. Principle one. Principle two was temple. Of course, in the law of Moses, there were sacrifices and things, and all uh, these things were fulfilled in the temple. If you love the law, you also must need to you must need to love the temple as well, because that's the place where the law can be fulfilled. And so it is to this day when you look at the ultra orthodox Jewish people praying there in Jerusalem by the Western Wall, they're praying for the temple to be rebuilt, because it's there that the law, which is the object of their affections, uh, can be fulfilled. Well, the temple was standing in these days, and the house of Onias had a love of Torah, a love of temple, and a love of a pious lifestyle. These people did not want to adopt the pagan ways of their captors. 
Well, the Sopharim become divided into these two parties. The faithful ones, known prior as Sopharim, become called, finally, the Chassidim, or pious ones. As I just mentioned, uh, to this day there are those called Chassidim, who we see pictures of. Uh, perhaps you've seen pictures of the devout Jewish people praying there in the, uh, by the Western Wall in Jerusalem. Or if you go to New York City, there's a very large Hasidic Jewish community, a few communities, rather. There's a few divisions amongst them in, uh, in New York, in uh, Brooklyn, in Williamsburg, which is a part of Brooklyn in particular. And here we see Jewish people donning dark black clothes, and they have the curls, they don't cut the corners of their hair, long beards, etc. The Hasidim, as they're called, it means pious ones. Now those who assimilated and gave up Moses under Greek influence became known as Hellenizers. So you have the Hasidim and the Hellenizers. Uh, the Hellenizers were those, who, again, who wanted to adopt. Hasidim on the one hand, and Hellenizers on the other. Now, the Hellenizers were much more amiable uh, to their foreign powers, and so they were given various favors in Judea. The Greek governors here uh, found that they were able to get along much better with those who wanted to assimilate and adopt their culture and, and their ways and means. And so it is that the, the Hellenists were able to, uh, to, to make much more progress in inroads into the politics of the day than were the Hasidim. And so the Hellenists uh, were given uh, control of the temple, finally, and some limited uh, political power. Remember, they were willing to bend to the Greeks much more so. They would accept the foreign culture. And so it is that the, the political ones the, uh, were the Hellenists, and the Hasidims were the teachers in the land. And so we see a separation here between church and state, if you will. There was the, the Jewish people who assimilated the modernists who more or less had much more political favors from their, the Greek captors, and they were the Hasidim that weren't interested in politics at all. These were the teachers, the teachers in the synagogue, the teachers of the law. And so there's a division here that the Hellenizes, the Hellenists who had control of the temple now eventually became known as the Sadducees who controlled the temple really in the time of Christ. The Hasidim who were loyal to the law of Moses and wouldn't assimilate became known finally as the Pharisees. So we see two parties in Jewish history that had developed and we know from the New Testament how these uh, two parties were in operation. Uh, when we look at the Sanhedrin, the ruling body of the Jewish elite, in the days of Christ, we see that they were made up of members of the Sadducees and the Pharisees as well. Now let's turn uh, to, to the New Testament. If you go, please, to the book of Acts. Acts is the history of the New Testament. And if you will, please turn to Acts chapter 23. We're going to look at Paul the Apostle. Paul, the born-again Orthodox Jewish rabbi, a person schooled in the traditions of Judaism, the religious trad traditions, who came to a saving knowledge of Jesus, believing him to be Messiah and Lord, this Paul is now before the Sanhedrin. And let's note the way Paul addresses them, and let's see what happens. Verse 23. And Paul, earnestly beholding the council, said, Men and brethren, I have lived in all good conscience before God until this day. And the high priest Ananias commanded them that stood by him to smite him on the mouth. He said that, and the high priest had Paul hit, hit in the face. Then Paul said unto him, God shall smite thee, thou whited wall. <laughs> Paul said, you whitewashed tomb, you hypocrite. God's going to smack you across the face as well. For sittest thou to judge me after the law, and then commandest me to be smitten contrary to the law? Paul said, look, you're gonna, you, this is the ruling body, the rabbinical council, if you will, the leaders of the Jewish people, and you're going to judge me according to the law of Moses, and you're going to violate the law of Moses and have me hit without any good cause. And they that stood by said, Revilest thou God's high priest? They said, Paul, is that any way to talk to the high priest? Do you know who that is? 
Then Paul said, uh, I didn't know, brethren, that he was the high priest, for it is written, Thou shalt not speak evil of the ruler of thy people. Paul said, I didn't know. <laughs> I'm sorry. I didn't realize who he was. But when Paul perceived, now let's get into it. But when Paul perceived that the one part were Sadducees and the other Pharisees, He cried out, saying, Men and brethren, I am a Pharisee, the son of a Pharisee. Of the hope and resurrection of the dead, I am called in question. Paul uses some Jewish shekel here, uses some smarts. Noticing that the council is divided, apparently pretty evenly, between Pharisees and Sadducees, he, explains, he exclaims, Brethren, I am a Pharisee, the son of a Pharisee. And you have me here for interrogation because I believe in the resurrection of the dead. And when he had said this, there arose a dissension between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and the multitude was divided. He said that, and there was a dissension. There was division amongst the council. They were divided one between another. Why did this divide them? Well, it says it in verse 8. Luke, who is the author of Acts, explains this. He says, For the Sadducees say that there is no resurrection, neither angel nor spirit, but the Pharisees confess both. Now note here that, that, there's, that he's explaining how there's a division between the two parties. The Pharisees believe one way, and the Sadducees believe another. And what is the way that they believe? Well, the, the Pharisees believe in a resurrection, angels, spirits, afterlife, etc., etc., and the Sadducees don't believe any of that. They don't believe any of that. Now, here's my question, and of course I'll answer it. Why do these parties have different convictions? Well, let's go back to our history and see if we can understand why. Remember that the Sadducees were the modernists. They were the political ones and what have you, the ones that were looking to make it. Here and now was their attitude. They weren't interested in hoping in a life to come, things like that. No, they were interested in, they were like the secular humanists. They had a, a type of religion. Yes, they did. They, they believed in the five books of Moses, didn't put much stock in the prophets. They didn't hold the prophets to be as scripture, they consider it to be, you know, of, of, of some report, but uh, it's not Torah. It's not the five books of Moses. They weren't interested in life after and things like that. The Hellenists were the modernists who became the Sadducees, and the traditionalists, those who wanted to adhere to the teaching of the sages of old, the, those who penned scripture, those who wanted to adhere to the precepts of their fathers, were the Pharisees. Well, the Sadducees have no hope in an afterlife. They're looking to make it now, while the Pharisees have a future hope. And so it is we can see uh, those divisions in Scripture. And when Paul said, I'm on trial because of my convictions with regards to the, the resurrection from the dead, well, right away, they, they all went at odds with each other. Now, again, the Pharisees were the good guys, the ones who stood for Scripture, those who gave their lives for it. Uh, the Pharisees come from the Hebrew word parush, the Hebrew verb meaning to be separate. They were the separatists, those who wouldn't assimilate. They were the fundamentalists of the intertestamental period as it began. The good guys. For quite a while, the Pharisees were the saints. They were the faithful ones, the good guys, the ones with the white hats. The Pharisees held the torch for a season. They represented everything that was noble in that they fought and died to preserve the word of God. Well, both Jewish history and the New Testament attest to the fact that they became quite corrupted. Again, we hear scathing condemnation aimed at the Pharisees in the Gospels. In particular, Jesus, prior to Calvary, as he went into Jerusalem at the end of his public ministry, there he is, we read in, 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 uh, in Matthew, his woes to the Pharisees, you whitewashed tombs, you hypocrites, etc., etc. Now, please understand, 
Well, I'll tell you, let's uh, go to Matthew. Turn to the Gospel of Matthew, and I'm sure you know where that is. It's, it's the first book of the New Testament. And let's look at Matthew chapter 23, where Jesus condemns the parushim with the woes. We see them in verse uh, 13. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, if you shut up the kingdom of heaven against men. Verse 14 in Matthew chapter 24. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, if you devour widows' houses. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, you compass land and sea to make a proselyte, and then when you make them more of a child of hell than you are yourselves. Woe unto you, in verse 16, you blind guides. Woe unto you, fools, etc., etc., etc. Now, people have taken this and it's rather unfortunate to be an indictment against the Jewish people. Well, there's been a not more than there's been more than one anti-Semitic pulpiteer who has used this passage to to breathe fiery threats and throw fiery darts at the Jewish population, saying, "Look how Jesus condemned them." Please understand, this wasn't an indictment against the Jewish populace in any way, shape, or form. This was an indictment by a Jew to other Jews. This was Yeshua, Jesus, uh, condemning the parushim. And let me tell you something. When Jesus is, is throwing these uh, verbal darts, piercing statements at the Pharisees, there are many Jewish people in that time that weren't followers of Jesus that would cheer Jesus on for that statement. There were a lot of uh, Jewish people that weren't happy about the state of affairs. Now let's look at the demise of the Pharisees. But first, let's catch up on some of our history. Now we saw how the Greek presence caused the division amongst the Jewish people into two groups. Number one, those that were faithful to Moses, whom we call the house of Onias, and those who assimilated the Hellenists known as the house of Tobias. And this happened under Greek influence. Well, we discussed Alexander the Great, the one who brought all this about. Following the death of Alexander the Great, the Greek empire was divided amongst his four generals. Alexander left no sons. And so his vast empire was divided up amongst his, uh, the, the leaders in his army, those who would be the naturals, uh, as contenders for, for power. The empire was divided up amongst his four generals, and in particular, we want to focus on two of them. The first of which is Ptolemies, who, was, uh, who had the area that we know of now as Egypt, and other areas as well, and Antiochus, whom we know as Antiochus Epiphanes, who was given Syria and territory surrounding that. Now, these two generals got these two regions, and guess what little parcel of land was in between? You bet. The land of Israel. It seems to be in the middle of everything, all the time. Uh, in, in today's events, Israel's in the middle again. How can Israel be in the middle? Well, as people are interested in petroleum and, and shipping lanes through the Middle East and all this other stuff, uh, Israel comes into focus again, as is ordained by God and as is prophetic, as we will be uh, seeing in our study of Israel and end-time events, but that's a subject for another day. Here we have Antiochus Epiphanes and Ptolemy's two generals. And as often as is often the case with people who have power, they're not content with power, they're content with more power and more power yet. As um, the, the, the wise uh, Solomon tells us, in his Proverbs, that the eye is not satisfied with seeing, nor the ear with hearing. People want more and more and more. People covet more and more for themselves. And so it is that Antiochus Epiphanes in particular was bent on taking Egypt for himself, and he wanted to destroy Ptolemies and have the whole region for himself. And these two, of course, would be at war, at war with each other. Now, if you're a general and you're at war... There's one thing you need if you want to be a successful general. Well, you need to know something about the land that you're fighting, and yes, you need to know the terrain, you need to know the army, 
You need to know the capability of your army. You need to know the capability of the other person's army, etc., etc., etc. All these things you need to know, and you need to have an arsenal yourself, lots of spears, lots of swords, uh, things like that. But there's one thing you need to have above everything else if you want to be a successful general. If you want to have a successful military campaign, you need to be able to pay your troops. <laughs> you have to meet payroll. It's hard to tell a bunch of soldiers, you know, <laughs> you know, you tell them every Friday the check's in the mail. After a couple Fridays, they're going to get a very discontent. <laughs> and one time in battle, they might miss. <laughs> you might wind up with a, uh, uh, an arrow in your back. You have to pay your troops. And Antiochus Epiphanes, as his military campaigns took him uh, to Egypt, he'd of course cross Israel. And he was mindful of his need for cash. And he becomes aware that the Jewish people have a real reservoir of cash somewhere. That there, Antiochus Epiphanes becomes aware that there's a place where he can go to get all sorts of goodies. And you know where that place was? It was in the Temple of Jerusalem. And he figured he'd just take the temple for himself. And it, <laughs> the money in that temple would make a good contribution to his war effort. And so what does he do? He sacks the temple... And he takes off with the money therein, and he melts down the utensils used in the service of God and what have you. He turns it into hard cash to pay for his war. Now, why was there so much money in the temple? Well, you know, it was the logical Jewish bank. <laughs> it was the, the, the temple in Jerusalem was the logical Jewish bank. Well, let, let's put it together. If you were a Jew living in Judea in that time... Where would you want to put your money? You'd want to put it in the safest place you could find. So you'd put it in the temple. I mean, who would rob God? <laughs> who would go to God's house and rob a Jew? Wouldn't do it. A Jew wouldn't do it. But you know who would? You got it, Antiochus Epiphanes. Well, to add insult to injury, Antiochus Epiphanes did much worse than just that, even though that was quite pathetic. As governor and lord of Judea, which he took to be his own, he realized that the strength of the Jewish people was in their religion. So he sought to destroy Judaism. He wanted to, to bend and mold the Jewish people after his, uh, to suit his own purposes. And he realized that as governor, he really couldn't get control of the Jewish people unless he destroyed their religion. So what did he do? He suspended temple ritual. Jews were not allowed to go there and offer sacrifices to Jehovah anymore. Antiochus Epiphanes went on to set out to destroy all the Torahs, all the scriptural texts that he could get his hands on. He burned, he destroyed, and he made it against the law for any Jew to study them. Jewish people were not allowed to keep the Sabbath. They were forced to work on the Sabbath. They couldn't rest. They couldn't keep it. Kosher food was outlawed. Antiochus Epiphanes forbade Jewish people to keep their kosher laws. Circumcision was outlaw outlawed. Jewish people were not allowed to circumcise their children. This was terrible. Not only did he seek to destroy Judaism, he went to the most sacred shrine in Judaism. And there, in the temple of God in Jerusalem, he goes into the holy place, not the, whole, the holy of holies. He goes into the place where the ark would reside, the ark of the covenant. And there he makes an altar to Zeus, and he offers pigs. He sacrifices swine in the temple. In Daniel chapter 9 and elsewhere as well, we read about this abomination which makes desolate. While this horrible situation existed in, amongst the Jewish people in the land of Judea, and there were those who were waiting for a time to revolt. Needless to say, there was bitter discontent. There was a disdain for this Antiochus Epiphanes and the things that accompanied his rule. And they were looking for an opportunity to throw off the yoke of this Antiochus Epiphanes, the Syrians. 
Well, there was a Hasmonean from the priesthood of Zadok whose name was Mattathias. He wasn't the only leader of the revolt, but he was became the, the first famous leader. Now what happened is, is as Antiochus Epiphanes set about to destroy Judaism, he would send his captains into various districts and gather up all the people, all the Jewish people, and he would assemble them together in the town square, and they'd have an altar there, and he would force uh, the leaders of these Jewish people to sacrifice pigs on the altar. And such was the case one afternoon when the captain and his men arrive in town, and they assemble the people together, and the aged Mattathias was brought forth and commanded to slay this pig and offer it to God. And the captain gave Mattathias his sword and commanded him to slay the pig. Well, what Mattathias did is he slayed the captain instead. He killed him. And he lifted his sword high and said, All those who were for God, follow me. And what happened was those, <laughs> they, they quickly overcame the soldiers who were with the captain, the Syrian soldiers. And we see the beginnings of this band of revolutionaries. They quickly dispersed and went up to the hills. And as news spread that there were defectors, that they were going off to the hills and forming an army, more and more Jewish people joined their ranks. And this ever-growing army was formed. They'd make raiding parties by night, and they would hide out in the day or vice versa, and they were up there in the hills, and this army gathered together of Jewish people who were ready to throw off the yokes. And this army consisted of the more liberal-minded Hellenist-type Jews and the, who, who themselves couldn't even stomach what was going on, and the Pharisees as well, the teachers of the law, said, listen, uh, the, the teachers, the Pharisees, were conscientious objectors. By the way, to this day, in Israel, the ultra-Orthodox Jews don't have to fight in the Israeli army. There's an exception. They don't have to do it. They're conscientious objectors. Um, but even the conscientious objectors, even the, 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 uh, those who became the Pharisees here, even these people, the religious, the teachers of the law, who weren't interested in politics, they were just interested in being able to be Jews. They joined ranks with his army. They were into it 100% endorsing it, saying, listen, this situation here is intolerable. Uh, taking up arms is our only viable alternative. We have to get rid of this. This is pathetic. And so it is this army gets going and begins making raiding parties and begins attacking the small Syrian forces that were there. Now, Antiochus Epiphanes and his men weren't in uh, Judea in bulk at this time. The reason being is that Antiochus and his men were there in uh, Egypt fighting with Ptolemies. So the bulk of his forces were not in Judea, which made it easier for this revolt to be successful. And so it is that the revolt picks up more and more steam. Uh, the, the Jewish armies retake more and more cities. And finally, they come to Jerusalem and retake the city, and they retake the temple. Well, Mattathias had died earlier in the revolt, and his most famous son, Judah, was the leader, known as Judah Maccabee. His last name wasn't Maccabee. On his birth certificate, it didn't say Maccabee, comma, Judah. No, Maccabee means the hammer, and he was known as the hammer. He was the one, the, 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 the leader that struck the blows, the hammering blows on the Syrians. And Judah Maccabee retakes the temple and reinstitutes services to Jehovah there. The Syrians were defeated. The temple was retaken by the Jewish forces. The temple was cleansed of its filth. The altars to the, to the pagan deities were destroyed. The place was cleansed. They all got out on their hands and knees and got out the ammonia and got a scrubbing. And they rededicated the temple to God.
Now, in order for the Jewish rededication, uh, they, they had this lamp, the menorah, this candelabra that was burnt, and it would, need to, it would need to be lit for eight days, but there was only one vial of oil that would last for only one day. And they used that anyways, and miraculously it burnt for the eight days. And so it is that uh, the uh, Jewish holiday began from this, known as Hanukkah. Hanukkah, which means dedication or rededication. Hanukkah is the Jewish holiday during which time Jewish people remember how God freed them from beneath the yoke of the Syrians. Now, it's the only Jewish holiday, by the way, that isn't mentioned in the Old Testament. And of course it, it wouldn't be mentioned in the Old Testament because uh, the Old Testament closed at uh, 430 some odd years and here we're in the second century B.C., so we're a few hundred years after the close of the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, there are various holidays and feasts that are outlined. And by the way, we will be going into the feasts in the Old Testament and show how they relate to Messiah in our study of the, uh, the Messiah and the Law of Moses. So I don't want to discuss those feasts very much. But there were various feasts that Jewish people would celebrate uh, as dictated in the Law of Moses at certain times during the year. And this Hanukkah was added to those feasts. And again, it's the only Jewish holiday that's not mentioned in the Old Testament. To this day, Hanukkah doesn't have the prominence of... Um, well, wait, I take that back. To this day, at present, Hanukkah's become a very prominent Jewish holiday. It didn't used to be that way historically. It didn't used to be that way at all. Uh, Hanukkah is, is the only Jewish holiday today that, that you don't get off work for. You don't take off any work. Uh, there's no there's no fasting or anything like that during Hanukkah. Um, it doesn't have the historical roots as does the uh, the other feasts that are mentioned in Scripture. Uh, there's one good reason why the uh, Hanukkah the holiday of Hanukkah is so important. I'll tell you what it is. As Jewish people were scattered throughout the the, the world, scattered throughout Europe, uh, they were in a world where predominantly the people were a part of the institutional Christian Church. Some of these were people that really did respond to the gospel and were regenerate, and others were just people that had it as their religion. Well, whether you were a real Christian or just a, quote, nominal Christian, uh, they celebrated holidays, during which time they would give gifts to their children. And so it was that Jewish people lived in a world where, where they were with Christians, and Christians were always giving gifts to their children. So you know what would happen? Come Christmas time, Jewish kids would come home and they'd go, Mommy, I wish I was a Christian because they get all the presents. <laughs> well, the Jewish authorities had the answer for that. We'll give presents on Hanukkah as well. And so it is that for the eight days of Hanukkah, Jewish people have presents and there's games that we play and what have you. It's for the children. And it's became prominent. But it wasn't just a prominent holiday in our day. I mean, it had some importance, not like Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. Uh, we read in, in the Gospel of John, if we'll turn to John chapter 10, the Gospel of John, written by Yohanan, whom we call John. Chapter 10, beginning in verse 22. I'll just read two verses, 22 and 23, but turn there. It says, And it was at Jerusalem, the feast of the dedication, and it was winter. And Jesus walked in the temple in Solomon's porch. It was winter time. It was the feast of dedication, and there was Jesus. going. going he, there he goes up to the temple, and he's in the temple. Jesus was a Jew, and he lived and functioned as a Jew. Hanukkah is a time when, when Jewish people celebrate how God delivered them from the hand of the Syrians and how they were able to rededicate the temple. And so Jewish people would go to the temple in Hanukkah. And there's Jesus, who himself was a Jew, there in the temple at Hanukkah. You know, there's a TV commercial, I believe, for American Heritage, I think it's called, magazine. And the, the spokesman quotes one of our presidents who one time said, the only thing new in the world is the history you do not know. Well, now you understand Hanukkah. It's just become history that you now know. So it's new. Well, the Jewish people were able to gain some freedom there, but they really didn't throw off the Syrians altogether, no. Uh, but what happens is, is uh, they did rededicate the temple, and the Syrians never went back to retake it. Actually, uh, by the year 164 B.C., the Syria sees that they won't get their way, and they give religious freedom to the Jewish people. They tried to kill Judaism, but it just wouldn't work. It just wouldn't work. You, you, could, you could injure it, but it always grows back to, uh, you, you just can't kill it. 
And the Syrians saw that, the, that they weren't going to get their objections, and so it is that they say, listen, we'll give you your religious freedom. Well, remember, this war, th this uh, army of Jews consisted of modernist-type Jews and religious Jews as well. Now, when Syria said, okay, Jews, listen, we'll give you religious freedom, the Hasidim, the religious ones, say, okay, that's enough. Finish. They put down their arms. Now, the other, the other Jewish people weren't so willing to put down their arms. They said, no, let's finish business and get rid of the Syrians altogether. Well, the Hasidim, the religious, the teachers, the doctors of the law weren't interested in, in, in fighting and killing and things like this. Uh, remember, the Hasidim, the early Pharisees, they wanted study of Torah. They, they, they wanted a, the, the peaceful life of studying Torah and living according to God's precepts. And now that they were given religious freedom, they have accomplished their objectives. They weren't politically minded. Well, uh, not, not every other Jew was, was, was of that frame of mind. And there were divisions. There's a period in Jewish history where the Jewish people did get their freedom. And much more freedom, much more freedom is given to them. Uh, let's just skip ahead now. The year is... Uh, 128 BC and the leader is Jonathan Hyrcanus and he's the grandson by the way of Mattathias the Maccabee the one who was the leader of this revolt he was a Hasid a, 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 a Hasmonean descended from that line as was of course um, Mattathias now what happens is, is things are relatively peaceful you know all is quiet on the western front and and Jonathan Hyrcanus Yohanan Jonathan um, has a banquet, and he gathers together all the other leaders. You know, they had freedoms now, militarily and politically and religiously and what have you. He has a banquet, invites all the other leaders, and he asks for constructive criticism. You know, sitting around the, the, the table talking, and he says, well, what do you think, fellas? You know, um, how am I doing? How am I doing? It's kind of like a, you know... Uh, we have Gallup polls and what have you taking today. You know, the, the government wants to see how they're doing. So he says, how you doing? How am I doing? He asks for some criticism. But what he's really wanting is a pat on the back. What happens is, is Eliezer, who is a chassid, he tells John to resign. The room is, 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 is full of chassidim, the religious, the teachers of the law. And here's Eliezer, a prominent Spokesman among them, he just gets up and says, John, listen, I think your reign stinks. you got to resign. Get out of here. I mean, Hyrcanus asked a direct question, and he got a direct answer. Well, you know what happens? John Hyrcanus takes offense at this, and feeling that his authority might be undermined, he leaves the Hasidim, and he goes and joins the Hellenist party, the party of the modernists, the liberal ones. You know, how often times do we do this? We're asking for criticism, but we really want a pat on the back. Now, I've, I do this. You know, I go around and speak in churches a lot, and you know, different conferences and what have you. And my wife uh, will come with me as she has opportunity to do so. She teaches college, and she, you know, she's not always able to get away. You know, sometimes she has to grade exams or prepare lectures or something. She's not able to be with me all the time. But she'll come with me, you know, more times than not. She's, she's into it. She likes to go there and minister as well. And uh, a lot of times after a service, I'll preach and I'll say, well, honey, how did I do? And Pat will say, I don't think you did so hot. And I'll get mad. I'm not asking for, what I really want is a pat on the back. Give me some encouragement. Well, now, you know, that, that's the way it was when we first got married. Really now she, she's learned me, you know, to understand me a little better. And she knows how to meet my needs in that respect a little more. We have a great relationship. I really love my life, my wife. Uh, and anyways, you know, the th you know the thing, how sometimes we ask for criticism, but what we really want is, is compliments. Well, that's what Jonathan Hyrcanus did. And when he saw that there was a vocal um, discontent with his rule, he quickly moved over to the, the Hellenists, who would be all too glad to receive him. Thus, the Hasmonean leadership and the Hellenists join up, and the Sadducees come as a result of this later on. Now, Jonathan Hyrcanus really wasn't in, sh in such good shape. I mean, if Eliezer didn't like him, which of course he didn't, there's good reasons for them. John really was blowing it. Let me give you an example. John Hyrcanus forced the conversion of other people to Judaism. 
in particular, history tells us about how he went to the Edomites and forced them by the sword to either die or be circumcised. He forced them to become Jews. Now here you have the high priest acting like a Syrian. What, what's really the difference between him and Antiochus Epiphanes? Antiochus Epiphanes, who lived earlier, uh, forced the Jewish people to, to, to give up being a Jew and become as a Greek. And here, uh, the high priest is forcing the Gentiles to become as Jews. What's the difference? Pathetic. Anti uh, Antiochus Epiphanes tried to force his culture on the Jews. Well, here you have Jewish power forces uh, trying to force Judaism on Gentiles. Very, very bad, bad move. Well, in the year 104 B.C., Hyrcanus dies. And here we are now, 100 years before Christ. He dies... And Aristobulus I becomes priest and king. What does he do then? Being the real sweetheart that he is, he puts his half-brother in prison named Alexander Janus, and he, he reigns for one year. Jo um, Aristobulus was completely Hellenized. He dies, and then Alexander Jani, or Janus, gets out of prison, and he marries Aristobulus' widow. And then Alexander Jani, or Janus, becomes the high priest and king. Well, things were downhill. I want to I make a separate point of um, explaining about Alexander uh, Janus. Now let's look at something. You know that during the New Testament times, Jewish people expected a Messiah to come. And they expected him to drive off the Romans. They expected uh, the Messiah to be not only a religious figure, but a political figure as well. They expected him to be religious, political, military, civic, to encompass the whole gamut. They expected a Messiah who was going to be a military leader. Now, I want you to understand, here we are a hundred years before Jesus. And even before this, uh, we see about the merging of power, how you have those of the priesthood coming into power. We see it with John Hyrcanus. Uh, Mattathias Maccabee himself was a Hasmonean. He was a priest as well, became the leader. You see the merging of the religious and the political leader, the religious and the military, is joined here in one office at this period of time. This is what Jewish people were accustomed to at this point in time. Now, if you want to go back many years, during the period of the Old Testament, uh, we read, go back to the book of Samuel. Um, and again, you can refer to the chart in the uh, survey of the Old Testament. I hope you refer to these charts, which, which you have to fill out a lot of them. They can serve to put information in a, in a picture form to help you to remember it more easily. But you refer to the chart, you go to the book of Samuel. What takes place in Samuel? Well, here we see different characters in Samuel. We see there's Samuel the prophet, and Saul, and then David the king. And then there were priests. There was the school of the priests. It's all there in Samuel. There were separate offices. Church and state was separate. Well, such was not the case here. We see that uh, the merging of those offices. And so that's what people became used to, and they expected a Messiah, the religious figure, to be a, a military figure as well. Well, the offices became merged, and we come uh, uh, where I left off here with Alexander Janus, or Yana. And let me tell you something. This guy was the worst of the worst. This guy was the worst of the worst. He, he became completely Hellenized. Completely Hellenized. And of course, here you have a high priest. His name was Alexander. I mean, it's a Greek name. It shows the inroads that, that Hellenization made into the Jewish uh, elite here. He's completely Hellenized, and this guy was bad news. He didn't like competition. He didn't like competition. You know what he does? Terrible, terrible, terrible. Alexander Janus, the high priest, has 800 Pharisees crucified. Crucifies 800 of his brethren, the teachers of the law. He has 800 Pharisees crucified. And if that wasn't bad enough, 
while they were dying, strung up, they're dying, bleeding to death, being tortured because of the means of their execution, while they were dying, the high priest brings in their wives and children and has them killed right in front of them. Now this is the man who had control of the priesthood. And we're looking at the century before Christ. Now listen, don't take my word for this. Uh, consult Jewish history books of your own and you'll see where, where it's talked about. Alexander Jenna, a nightmare this man was. So you look at the priesthood, it becomes perverted. It's a political power game. It's nonsense. Of course, there were those who did love God that were part of the, the elite of the Jewish people. And they depart. They say, enough of this. And they leave and, and they go out. And uh, there's communities that were formed because of discontent of what was happening uh, with the religious people in the political power games. There were various communities that were formed. Uh, we know of the Essene community for one. And to this day, you can go to uh, Israel. And I hope you do go to Israel, gang. I'm telling you, it's not just a vacation. Listen, if you want a vacation, go to Hawaii. <laughs> but if you want a vacation that's really an experience, go to Israel. Hawaii can give you, and other places as well, can give you a good vacation. But there's a certain experience that the real Bible believer can have upon a visit to, to the land of Israel. We can go there to this day, and right there by the Dead Sea, there's this community, the Qumran community. And the ruins of that community are there to this day. Now, these Aseans were, were composed of various people, some of which were priests who left. Priests who said, I wouldn't touch what's happening in Jerusalem with a 10-foot pole. Forget it. No, and they went out in the wilderness, formed their own communities. And these were scribes and uh, very literate, intelligent people. They formed, uh, uh, they copied manuscripts and what have you. To this day, you've heard of the Dead Sea Scrolls. Uh, the, these were manuscripts of scripture and other sources as well. Uh, these people formed. Well, there were a lot of people that were not very happy about what was happening amongst the religious re elite. So again, I'll, I'll go back to what I was saying when we were reading from Matthew there. Those woes and those stark condemnations to the scribes. You hypocrites, you game players, you liars, you blind fools, etc. Believe me, Jesus w was just reflecting a lot of public sentiment when he said that. It's not just uh, the New Testament that, that gives... Uh, uh, scathing remarks about uh, the, the, the leaders in, in Jerusalem. It, uh, Jewish history does as well. But of course, as we know, it wasn't all the Jewish leaders that were bad. We read about uh, Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea and other members of the Sanhedrin, the ruling body, the 70 top leaders. How they were, they were good guys amongst them. Yet nonetheless, the whole system became corrupted. Well, the year 66 B.C. now, and Rome appears in Damascus, and they're just a, a hop, skip, and a jump away from the Holy Land, and uh, Rome comes to power, and the office of high priest is up for sale to the highest bidder. What happens is Rome comes to power, and there's really no way, I mean, it's even pointless. You don't try and fight Rome. They were too big. They were too much. They were just too awesome. So for Jewish people were forced to strike a deal, and uh, Rome says, listen, well, the, the leadership of the, the religious community, who was the main spokesman for the Jewish people, they said, listen, uh, it's up for the highest bidder. So different people, you know, you know <laughs> it's like bidding for a job. They said, this is what we'll pay for it, and the one who paid the most wins. I was in Colorado a couple weeks ago, and uh, there was a bumper sticker I saw. It said, the one who dies with the most toys wins. Pathetic statement. They think that uh, the more money you have, then when you die, then you win the game. Well, that certainly isn't true. But here, with regards to the priesthood, it certainly was true. The one with the most toys, the one who could produce the most goods, was the one who became the leader. And here we have a very, very, very sad state of affairs. Well, we've been tracing a very sad thing here. The once spiritual elite of Israel fall prey to power struggles and political intrigue, and the whole thing became messed up. The religious leader became the political leaguer as well, and this didn't work out well. The religious and the civil were joined together. It didn't work out well. You know, it usually doesn't for that matter. <laughs> it usually doesn't. When you look at church history, um, when we saw uh, church leaders being political leaders, it was always a mess. You take the Catholic Church, for instance. 
uh, Catholicism was established as a kind of theocracy. They weren't, it wasn't just, you know, yeah, we have our religion and we pray on Sundays. These people controlled kings and whole governments in Europe. And many, many, many atrocities. Oh, gosh, millions of gallons of blood were shed uh, under that. And then, of course, the Protestant Reformation came along, which, which really, um, I'm, I'm tempted to say it wasn't a whole lot better. It really was. You know, it, it, it certainly was, but there were problems, I want to say. Uh, there was Catholicism, and then the Protestant Reformation came along, and there were problems as well. Calvin, one of the fathers of the Protestant Reformation, um, writes... Uh, well, history tells how he had a man put to death who didn't agree with his particular uh, theological uh, convictions. And in America, here in our own history, you know, in New England, we had the uh, Salem witch trial. Someone was an alleged witch, and they were burned at the stake and what have you. Uh, religious power, and, uh, religious leaders never did very, very well as civic leaders. Um, religion and power poses some real problems. Now, when Messiah Jesus returns and sets up the kingdom... Bingo, I have all the confidence, and I'm sure you do as well, that Messiah will do a good job at ruling things, and I'd rather wait for him. Well, religion and power never did very well, uh, and of course, as we discussed here, it, it certainly did corrupt the priesthood. And again, as I said, when Christ called the Pharisees hypocrites, etc., a lot of people were well behind him. A lot of people were well behind him. Well, we've looked at some... Of the events of the intertestamental period, we've looked at the rise and fall of the Pharisees again. And finally, with regard to the Pharisees, remember that they once upon a time were the champions of the Torah. They were the maintainers of biblical tradition amidst the secular world of their day. They were the bright lights in their darkened days. But they finally excuse me, fell victim to political intrigue and lust for power, etc. Now, I believe there's some good lessons to be learned in all this, and you might take a moment to reflect upon some of them. Well, there's a recap, and I hope you benefited from it. It's a recap of some of the major events that took place during the intertestamental period. Now, as I've mentioned before, we'll oftentimes, the, we'll oftentimes call the intertestamental period the silent years. Um, the reason being that the Old Testament closed 430 years before Christ. And so from 430 B.C. to Messiah, uh, we don't have any inspired voice. There is no Old Testament uh, writers. There's no Old Testament text. So they're called the silent years. Well, the intertestamental period might be called the silent years because it occurs after the Old Testament, but the Old Testament certainly is not silent about the intertestamental period. The Old Testament has, has things to say about the intertestamental period, prophetically. In other words, prior to the close of the Old Testament canon, the Holy Spirit moved such that the Old Testament writers would say things about the intertestamental period. In particular, we come to the prophet Daniel, who accurately predicted the major world events that would take place during the intertestamental period to the coming of Messiah and beyond the first coming of Messiah to his following to his second coming, to his reappearing then, to establish the kingdom. The prophet Daniel gives the whole scope of world history from the close of the Old Testament to the coming of Messiah and then the second coming of Messiah and the establishing of the kingdom. Daniel accurately predicted their major events that took place during the intertestamental period. I think that's fascinating. I don't know why you believe in the Bible, but one of the reasons why I have confidence in it is because I am amazed how the Bible calls the shots in advance. And now we're going to move on in this study and see how the Bible does that. We're going to Get into a good old Bible study here now. So you go ahead and get your Bible, and we'll turn to the prophet Daniel. Now, many folks learn about Daniel as a child in Sunday school. Uh, we hear stories, um, perhaps the most famous stories. Uh, we read about Daniel in the fiery furnace. Uh, Daniel's three friends, Shagrach, Meshach, and Abednego, were thrown in there, and how God delivered. We hear about Daniel in the lion's den. 
Well, today, Daniel is in the critic's den. He didn't have any problem with the Lions, but today he's in the critic's den, and he might be quite bent out of shape because today critics of Scripture claim, number one, that Daniel, the person Daniel, the historic person Daniel, didn't write Daniel, number one. And number two, they claim that Daniel was written uh, hundreds of years after the Bible says it was written. Critics give Daniel, the book of Daniel, a 2nd century B.C. date. Oh, they'll say about 167 B.C. is when they claim that the book of Daniel was written. And they say that Daniel was written as history. Now, uh, conservative theologians give Daniel a date from between, between 605 and 536 B.C., and we're going to examine where we come to that, why we come to that conclusion. The liberals, the liberal so-called theologians who want to strip the Bible of any kind of supernaturalism want to claim that Daniel was written 400 years later. Why? Why do they want to claim that Daniel was written in the 2nd century B.C.? Well, the reason is, as we're going to see, is that Daniel so graphically and beautifully predicts world events during the intertestamental period. The liberals want to say that the, 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 the book of Daniel was actually written after those events took place, and that the author of Daniel, whoever that is, is looking back in hindsight and retelling the story of history that had just taken place. He's writing it down in some mystical, prophetic kind of way to make it seem like it was written beforehand, but really it was written afterwards. So liberal critics want to claim that Daniel was written after the facts, while the text itself, and not only the text of Daniel, claims that it was written beforehand. In order to get some background first on Daniel, this Daniel who's in the critics' den, let's look at Daniel chapter 1, verse 1, and see how it is that we are able to ascribe dates to the book of Daniel. These aren't just arbitrary. You see in Daniel chapter 1, verse 1, we're going to look at Daniel 1, 1, Daniel 10, 1, and Daniel 11, 1, to see something about the dates. It says, in the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, came Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, unto Jerusalem and besieged it. And it tells the story of how certain lads were taken off. So we see here that and, and, and Daniel was, was one of the lads that was taken captive into, into Babylon, and there he was raised in the king's court. But it starts in the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah. And now we need to historically place Jehoiakim, which we're able to place, at uh, 606-605 B.C. Now let's go to 10.1. So the Bible gives us clues as to, as to when to date it in the text. And in Daniel chapter 10, 1, we read, In the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, a thing was revealed unto Daniel. So we need to fix, according to even secular uh, histories, when was Cyrus the king of Persia? Because it was right in the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, the third year of his reign, Daniel 10 takes place. The vision takes place. And in Daniel 11, 1, also, in the first year of Darius the Mede, even I stood to confirm and to strengthen him, etc. So it gives us certain fixed points by which we can determine the history and when things are taking place and when the author is speaking. So the time stand it can be determined by the book itself. We can put it between uh, 606, 605, and uh, 536 B.C. We read in 1-1 how Daniel is carried off into captivity. He's deported by Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and I discussed that. So the text itself, Daniel itself, gives its own dating. 
which the liberal critics want to disregard. So what they're saying, in essence, is that the text has no integrity. They're saying the text is lying. When the book claims to be written by a Daniel who lived back in the 6th century B.C., and he's saying such and such and such and such. The liberals are saying it was not written by a Daniel back then, etc., etc. And that just destroys the, the integrity of the text. That means it's deceit that's going on in here. That's number one. Secondly, and please turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 24, verse 14. Who did Jesus say was the author of the book of Daniel? Daniel is in the critics' den by the liberal theologians. Let's see if Daniel can be exonerated here. In Daniel chapter 24, verse 15, Jesus is speaking, and he says, And when ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place, whoso readeth, let him understand. What's the point here? What's my point? According to Jesus, Jesus believed that Daniel wrote Daniel because he's quoting. Jesus is alluding to, rather, uh, a prophecy in Daniel, which, which, is, which is a very, very clear illustration here. He's pointing back to an event spoken of by Daniel the prophet. And he says, when you see this event as was spoken of by the prophet Daniel, so Jesus certainly believed that Daniel wrote the book of Daniel. <laughs> and if Daniel wrote the book of Daniel, then, he's the, then he wrote it in the 6th century B.C. according to the text. Obviously, Jesus believed that Daniel was the prophet of Daniel, the historic Daniel who lived back then and, and rose to prominence in uh, the king's court. So who's right? Is, the Old Test is, is Daniel right? Is the book right itself when it places its date in the 6th century B.C.? And is Jesus right when Jesus says that, it was, that Daniel was written by Daniel, who lived in the 6th century B.C., or is the liberal critics right? I mean, whose word are you going to take? Some liberal the theologian or Jesus Christ? <laughs> it's one or the other. And if Daniel didn't write Daniel, let's follow the reasoning. If Daniel really didn't write Daniel, but it was written by some historian 200 years before Christ who said his name was Daniel, and he just fabricated this book in order to, you know, write some beautiful history after the fact. Well, let, let's say that was the case. Well, then Jesus was mistaken in Matthew chapter 24, verse 15, because Jesus obviously believed that Daniel was written by the prophet Daniel. <laughs> then Jesus was mistaken. If Jesus was wrong in his understanding of Scripture, then Jesus really isn't the Messiah, the Savior, the Son of God. He doesn't know what he's talking about. Isn't it, isn't it interesting? It's kind of like a domino effect. If, you, if, if one domino falls, the others go with it. Well, I believe there's, there's good evidences, indeed, that, that Daniel was written by the prophet Daniel in the 6th century B.C. So, you know, it's interesting to note, by the way, that every chapter in, in Daniel is either alluded to or quoted from in the book of Revelation. Isn't that something? Every chapter in Daniel is either alluded to in Revelation or Daniel or Revelation quotes it, paints the same picture. This Daniel lived in the 6th century B.C. and prophesied about events ranging from his day to the second coming of Messiah, the establishment of the kingdom. He prophesied way in advance. He prophesied to the first coming of Messiah. Well, he prophesied the, inter the events in the intertestamental period, the coming of Messiah, the Messiah being cut off, uh, and the second coming of Messiah and establishing the kingdom. He covers the whole gamut. In particular here, for our study of Daniel, for now, we're going to look at his prophecies regarding the intertestamental period. Now, you know, we do have a course on end time events, but we don't want to get into that. That would be cheating. That'll come later. Here we're looking at the intertestamental period, and now we want to see what Daniel has to say about it. And this is really quite incredible. Turn, please, if you will, to Daniel chapter 2. Let's begin by telling a little story. We'll start in verse 1. And let me just read it. The text speaks well for itself. And uh, we'll see where we go. Daniel chapter 2, verse 1. Excuse me. And in the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar dreamed dreams wherewith his spirit was troubled and his sleep break within him. He had some dreams, some nightmares that woke him up and he was startled. And then the king commanded to call the magicians and the astrologers and the sorcerers 
the Chaldeans uh, and the Chaldeans for to show the king his dreams. So they all came and stood before the king. And the king said unto them, I have dreamed a dream, and my spirit was troubled to know the dream. Then spake the Chaldeans to the king, O king, live forever. Tell thy servants the dream, and we will tell you the interpretation of the dream. The king answered and said to the Chaldeans, The thing is gone from me. If you will not make known unto me the dream, with the interpretation, you shall be cut in pieces, and your houses shall be made a dunghill. <laughs> so he gathers together all these sorcerers and magicians and everything, and they say, O king, tell us your dream. The king was upset anyways. He says, listen, he says, I forgot the dream, but let me tell you something. I want you to tell me the dream, and not only to tell me the dream, but tell me the meaning of the dream. And if you don't do it, I'm going to slice you up and feed you to the dogs, and your houses are going to become a heap of ruins. <laughs> Let's face it, this king was mean. But, in verse 6, if you show the dream and the interpretation, you'll receive of me gifts and rewards and great honor. Therefore, show me the dream and the interpretation. They answered him again and said, Let the king tell his servants the dream, and we will show the interpretation of it. <laughs> so the, the, the fakers said, Now look, tell us the dream, and we'll tell you what it means. <laughs> the king answered and said, I know of certainty that you would gain the time, because you see the thing is gone from me. But if you will not make known unto me the dream, there is but one decree for you. For you have prepared lying and corrupt words to speak before me. Therefore, tell me the dream, and I shall know that you can show me the interpretation. The king said, listen, you're a bunch of liars. If you can really interpret, you tell me the dream that I had, and then the meaning, and then I'll know that your interpretation is correct. I'll know that the supernatural is involved. The Chaldeans answered before the king and said, There is not a man upon the earth that can show the king's matter. Therefore there is no king, lord, nor ruler that asks such things of any magician or astrologer or Chaldean. They said, look, this is impossible. No one can do this. No one's ever asked anything like this of us before. It's impossible. And it's a rare thing in verse 11 that the king requireth, and there is no other that can show it before the king except the gods whose dwelling is not with flesh. They said, only the gods know when they're not with us. And, well, in verse 12, For this cause the king was angry and very furious and commanded to destroy all the wise men of Babylon. Now, here you go. Now, maybe you're wondering, Hey, Syph, it's a great story. Yeah, hey, listen, great story, but what on earth does this have to do with the intertestamental period? You'll see. As you've been following these lectures, you probably know that I'm big on background. And that's what we're covering right here. So the king was angry in verse 12 and commanded everyone in the in the um, everyone in Babylon to, every wise man alleged wise man to be killed. Verse 13 and the decree went forth that the wise men should be slain. And they sought Daniel and his fellows to be slain. Then Daniel answered with counsel and wisdom to Arioch the captain of the king's guard which was gone forth to slay the wise men of Babylon. So the king's men are out making their rounds, and, and the captain knocks on Daniel's door. Daniel answers the door, and, you know, he sees, <laughs> to use the expression, Daniel sees the handwriting on the wall, he, he sees that there's problems here. And, and he said to Arioch, why is the decree so hasty from the king? Then Arioch, in verse 15, made the thing known to Daniel. Then Daniel went in and desired of the king that he would give him time and that he would show the king the interpretation. And then Daniel went to his house and made the thing known to Han, Aniah, Mishael, and Azariah, his companions, that they would desire mercies of God of heaven concerning this secret, that Daniel and his fellows should not perish with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. Then was the secret revealed unto Daniel in a night vision. Then Daniel blessed the God of heaven. Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, for wisdom and might are his. And he changeth the times and the seasons. He removeth kings and setteth up kings. He gives wisdom unto the wise and knowledge to them that know understanding. 
Now, here you go. He prayed and said, God, what was the dream that the king had and what's the meaning of it? And he and his friends sought the Lord and the Lord showed him what the dream was and what the dream meant. And he thanks God for it. And now he goes to the king. But first he's, he's praying here and he's just thanking God that, he, that, that, that he's given him the insight. In verse 22, oh God, you reveal the deep and secret things. He knoweth what is in the darkness and the light dwelleth with him. I thank thee and praise thee, O thou God of my fathers, who has given me wisdom and might, and has made known unto me now what we desireth of thee. For thou hast now made known unto us the king's matter. Therefore Daniel went to Arioch. Remember, he put, he put the captain of the guard on hold. He said, look, <laughs> put your sword away. Give me a couple minutes, please. Then Daniel went in unto Arioch, whom the king had ordained to destroy the wise men of Babylon. He went and said thus unto him, Destroy not the wise men of Babylon. Bring me in before the king, and I will show him, I will show unto the king the interpretation. Comes to Arioch and says, Look, I've got it all wrapped up. I know what the dream was, and I know what the dream means. Just give me an audience with the king. Bingo. Verse 25. Then Arioch, Arioch brought in Daniel before the king in haste, and said thus unto him, I have found a man of the captives of Judah, that will make known unto the king the interpretation. This is one of the fellows who was one of the captives of Judah. And remember we studied in the survey of Old Testament and as we went through Jewish history how the Jews were, were taken captive. Those in, in Judah were taken captive by Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and taken away. And here Ariok goes to the king and he says, Listen, one of these guys that we brought back from Judah, one of, the, one of their wise men, he's got what you want. And verse 26, And the king answered and said to Daniel, whose name was Belshazzar, he had his name changed, Art thou able to make known unto me the dream which I have seen, and the interpretation thereof? Daniel answered in the presence of the king and said, The secret which the king hath demanded, cannot the wise men, the astrologers, the magicians, the soothsayers, show unto the king? Say, listen, this thing you want, none of those farces can do it. But... But there is a God in heaven that reveals secrets and makes known to the king Nebuchadnezzar what shall be in the latter days. Thy dream and the visions of thy head upon thy bed are these. He goes right into it and he explains this dream that Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, had and forgot. And now Daniel comes and he tells him what it was that he dreamt and what that dream meant. And notice there's a clue. Verse 28, he says, But there is a God in heaven that reveals secrets and maketh known to the king what shall be in the latter days. He's saying, this is a prophecy that you've had. This is what's coming later. This is, this is a, a dream about what will come after you. But first, here's the dream. As for thee, O king, thy thoughts came into thy mind upon thy bed. What should come to pass hereafter? And he that reveals secrets makes known to thee what shall come to pass. He was wondering about what his future was going to be, what was going to happen to his kingdom. A lot of businessmen, they wonder, hey, listen, what's going to happen to my business when, I'm, when I retire or when I pass on and my children are there to run it? Many businessmen wonder. People that accumulate a fortune wonder, what, what, uh, I've labored to accumulate the, the, these, the, this money, this fortune, are my children going to squander it? What's going to become of it when I'm gone? And here's Nebuchadnezzar who amassed this great empire. He's wondering what's going to happen when he goes. So he's saying he had a dream. Daniel says, But as for me, the secret is not revealed to me for any wisdom that I have, more than any living, but, to, but, but, but for their sakes that shall make known the interpretation to the king, that thou mightest know the thoughts of thy heart. He says, Listen, it's not for me, I'm just a man. The, the meaning of this dream, what this dream was and what this dream means didn't come from me, from my mind. I don't know any more than the others who didn't know anything. But the Lord in heaven revealed this. And here is the dream. And this is prophetic, as you're going to see. Thou, O king, saw us, and behold a great image. This great image, whose brightness was excellent, stood before thee, and the form thereof was terrible. He sees this big statue, this big image. The image's head was of fine gold. 
his breast and his arms of silver, his belly and his thighs of brass, his legs of iron, his feet part of iron and part of clay. Thou sawest till that a stone was cut out without hands, which smote the image upon his feet that were of iron and clay, and broke them in pieces. Then was the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver, the, and the gold broken into pieces together, and became like the chaff of the chaff of the summer's threshing floors. And the wind carried them away, that no place was found for them. And the stone that smote the image became a great mountain that filled the whole earth. Now there was the dream. There was this statue, and the statue, the head was gold and the arms and what have you were silver, the midsection was bronze, the legs were iron, and the feet were made of iron and clay, this strange, enormous statue. And the stone comes and smashes it, and the thing falls to pieces. That was the dream that Nebuchadnezzar dreamt. And God revealed to Daniel what this dream meant. First, he revealed to him what the dream was. And you might say, okay, Saif, look, now what on earth does this have to do with the intertestamental period? Look, you're going to take this, this symbolic dream and somehow make it apply to the intertestamental period? You know what my answer is? No, I'm not going to do that. I'm saying, yeah, this is talking. A good chunk of this is talking about the intertestamental period, but don't take my word for it. This is kind of like uh, Matthew chapter 13. Remember Jesus told the parable of the seed that fell on good soil and bad soil? And the disciples said, what does this mean? And Jesus says in Matthew chapter 13 verse 18, Hear ye now the parable of the sower. He says, look, Jesus explained. Jesus tells a parable in the beginning of Matthew 13, and then he explains it in Matthew chapter 13. Here we see the same in Daniel chapter 2. Daniel first tells what the vision is, the parable, if you will, and then he goes on to explain it, saying, beginning in verse 36, this is the dream, and we will tell the interpretation thereof before the king. Thou, O king, art a king of kings, for the God of heaven hath given thee a kingdom, power, and strength and glory. And wheresoever the children of men dwell, the beasts of the field and the fowls of the heaven, hath he made them into thine hand, and hath made thee ruler over them all. Thou art this head of gold. And after thee shall arise another kingdom inferior to thee, and another third kingdom of brass, which shall bear rule over all the earth. And the fourth kingdom shall be as strong as iron, for as much as iron breaketh in pieces and subdueth all things, and as iron that breaketh all these, shall it break in pieces and bruise. So you see here, Daniel is explaining what this image was, this mysterious statue, which had a head of fine gold and silver beneath, and bronze thighs, and bronze waistline and midsection, and iron, iron legs, and iron and clay feet. He's explaining what it means. Now you'll note that he starts off saying, You're the head. And then there's silver, bronze, and iron, lesser and lesser metals. Please understand that from the time of the close of the Old Testament to the beginning of the New Testament, there are different empires that dominate. Here he's describing a kingdom, a great kingdom that Nebuchadnezzar has. And as he's explaining earlier, uh, he says, this is, uh, your dream was a dream that related to what is to come. And his empire, the Babylonian, the Babylonian Empire, was the head. And that was followed by the Silver, or the Medo-Persian Empire, which wasn't quite as strong, which was followed by the Greece Empire, the Greeks, which was followed by the legs there, the iron, the Roman Empire, this vast empire, which he describes and calls in verse 40, the fourth kingdom. So he's describing these various kingdoms which are to come, and they relate to the different parts of the statue. And interestingly enough, what happened in world history following um, Nebuchadnezzar was <laughs> the Persians, followed by the Greeks, followed by Rome. So here we see an illustration, and, and he goes into it further in Daniel chapter 7 with four beasts that he describes, a lion, a bear, a leopard, 
and this terrible beast that he calls it. And, and then he talks about the beast's ten horns. The lion, of course, is Babylon. And if you understand the nature of these empires, how beautifully they're reflected in calling them a lion for Babylon, a bear for the Medo-Persians, uh, a leopard for the Greeks, how Alexander swiftly, with the speed of a leopard, zoomed in and, and took over the world. This fourth beast, this terrible beast, as we call it, um, is the Roman Empire. And then things get a little fuzzy. We're looking at what we call the revived Roman Empire in, excuse me, the, uh, the Ten Horns. And we'll get into that another day. Well, to put it all together for us now, we see how the Bible predicted the events of the intertestamental period. The Bible said what was going to happen, and history just went on and proved what the Bible said. This happens on and on and on, again and again throughout history. To wrap everything up here, you know, we've looked at the intertestamental period and we've seen the rise and fall of various nations and we studied their effects on the Jewish people. We saw how the events of the intertestamental period were so beautifully predicted by the prophet Daniel. We saw Babylon, how she came to power. We discussed that and how Babylon fell to Persia and how Persia fell to the Greeks with Alexander the Great. We saw how when Alexander the Great died, his, his uh, empire was split up. But then finally, the Romans appear on the scene and just engulf everything. And finally, when Messiah comes, in his days were the days of the Roman Empire. The Jewish people were back in the land then. The temple was rebuilt. The priesthood was established once more and then became corrupted. And we discuss something of the rise and fall of the party known to us as the Pharisees. Now, we could have discussed more and more. We could have gone on and on and talked about all sorts of different things of the intertestamental period. But this should suffice to give you a good glimpse into what we know as the intertestamental period. God bless you, friends. Thank you for studying with us and, and go over your notes. And, and we hope this will be a blessing to you. God bless you. Bye-bye. Well, there you have it. Uh, we thought you would appreciate a study on the uh, Pharisees and the, and the Sadducees, of course. And we saw their noble uh, beginnings, and then the inevitable compromises, and finally the political intrigue that caused the demise of the whole system. Uh, they really had a noble start. Believers in, in Messiah can learn a lot from this, you know. Uh, the application, I suppose, is, is in legalism. Uh, the Pharisees had, uh, at first, a zeal for the law, and finally, a law that was a yoke. And uh, ultimately, they lost faith in their original principles, and uh, the, the law itself was practically forgotten. Uh, the application might be in the church that, uh, that we keep the first love. As Jesus told the church at Ephesus in Revelation 2, uh, you've done many good works, but you've lost your first love. Uh, if we don't have that childlike faith and that zeal for God that we had the moment we were saved, then we've lost something. And however much uh, scriptural knowledge and uh, uh, ritual we might propose and however much liturgy we might invent, uh, none of it comes down to real faith, real belief. So from the Pharisees and Sadducees who've come and gone before us, we may learn this lesson. Study hard. Study uh, hard. Review this material. It's all worthwhile. In, in a Jewish Christian kind of study, it's a necessary application. And uh, that is course number eight.